I'm Catherine Lemons. I'm an associate professor of anthropology at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And the book I'm going to be talking about is Divorcing Traditions, Islamic Marriage Law and the Making of Indian Secularism, which came out in 2019 with Cornell University Press. I undertook the project for a couple of different reasons. One um, is that I've long been interested in the question of secularism, and I've been really inspired by the work of Talal Assad and some of his students, in particular Hossein Agrama and Sabah Mahmoud, um, with whom I undertook my doctoral research. And I was also, in pursuing the question of secularism, interested to understand what it looks like in different contexts beyond the ones that anthropologists have mostly looked at, which are Egypt and France. And so in many ways, I undertook this project in order to ask about secularism in the context of a multi-religious liberal democracy, um, which is what led me to, uh, to India. And a little bit more specifically, as I got into thinking about this and sort of got into doing the field work, I realized that actually a very good way to understand secularism and how it works and what it looks like is actually to get a sense of what it feels like or how it's lived by members of the minority. And so this is what led me into the study of Islam and specifically Islamic legal practices. Main argument or the book that sort of came out of this has a couple of different arguments, I would say. Let me start by just saying that broadly speaking, it's an ethnography of Islamic legal expertise and practices in, as I've just said, the secular state of India. So uh, broadly speaking, then we're looking at the ways in which um, a Muslim minority and a minority in the sense of uh, numbers, right, population-wise, but also legally and politically a minority, the way in which um, Islamic judgments sort of take place in this context, right? And the argument, as I said, has a couple of entailments. The first one does have to do with secularism. So the first one is picking up on this argument that Assad and others have made, that secularism is actually not best understood as the separation of church and state. So one of the interventions that this book makes is the proposal that um, we're not looking at the separation of church and state when we're looking at secularism. We're not looking at something like the promotion of religious freedom uh, in private, coupled with its curtailment in public. But instead, when we're looking at secularism, we're actually looking at the ways in which different states and, as I'll argue, non-state organizations organize religion, right? So the ways in which religion is acceptable, the spaces in which it can be practiced, and how. So... This book picks up on that intervention to argue that it's actually not only the state that organizes religion in contemporary multi-religious uh, contexts, but that actually non-state institutions, such as the legal institutions I looked at, have a very important role to play. So that's one of the big uh, arguments of the book. Um, the second big argument of the book is that perhaps unexpectedly, a place that we consider to be extremely private, that is the family, and another space we consider to be private, that is religion and religious law, are actually central to the practice of secularism. And I think this is true not only in the context of India, but certainly it's true in the context of India. So the, the second big intervention then is to say that if we want to understand secularism as a practice, as something that is constantly being in the, pro in the process of being uh, produced, we actually need to look at the way in which the family is regulated in religious institutions. So the book is in three parts. The first part uh, deals with the state. The second part deals with Qazis, who are Islamic judges. And the third part looks at Mufti. So this is a different kind of Islamic jurist. All three parts of the book are interested in examining the ways in which marital dispute is adjudicated and dealt with by these three different kinds of actors, and is interested in looking at the ways in which these kinds of adjudication or these practices of adjudica adjudication relate to secularism and its ongoing production. So a little bit more specifically in the first part of the book, I give both a history of Islamic law and of Indian legal pluralism and the place of Islamic law in Indian legal pluralism. And I also look at the work of an NGO that's run by um, a group of Muslim women adjudicating marital disputes. The second part of the book looks closely at the work of um, a number of Sharia courts or Darul Qazas, uh, arguing that the way in which they deal with divorce both uh, relies on and in certain ways reproduce um, secular practices. And then the third part looks at the work of a mufti who adjudicates uh, family disputes in two different ways. One is by writing fatwas. Specifically, I look at fatwas on unilateral male divorce, referred to as triple talaq or talaq ulbain. 
And the second part looks at his very different kind of adjudication work, which involves what he calls spiritual healing. So the three parts of the book together look at different institutions, the ways in which they relate, and the ways in which I argue they together uh, contribute to producing secularism in India. I'm currently actually doing a project that comes directly out of this first one. Um, as I was finishing up the research for my first book, some of my interlocutors in Delhi said to me that if I really wanted to understand uh, how Islamic law works in India, I should go a little bit further east to a city called Patna, which is in um, still in North India, but about two thirds of the way to Calcutta, and visit an institution there that's been around since 1921, which is 20 years before um, independence, the height of the nationalist anti-colonial movement. And so I actually, I took them up on this. I went to this institution and I'm currently working on a book project that's a history and an ethnography of this institution. Um, and I'm arguing in this project that it's actually an exceptionally good place. This institution is an exceptionally good place to look at and to come to understand the history of post-colonial minority politics in India, but I think also elsewhere um, in, a, in a sort of particularly sharp way. And so this has to do both with the political history of the institution, with the changing political aims and practices of the institution, but also in relation to this, it's changing legal role and legal practices. So I'm again looking at law and its intersection with questions of politics and in particular minority politics.